What do you do once you've got the drain in and some closing remarks? So having inserted the drain, the next step is to use a 50ml syringe and a three-way tap and drain it to dryness and record the amount drained. While you're doing that, monitor the hemodynamics and repeat the echocardiogram to see that the fluid is clearing. If the patient's blood pressure drops, um, consider is the drain in the wrong place? Um, and obviously the echo should hopefully show that the fluid is clearing. Now, there is a risk of a condition called pericardial decompression syndrome if you rapidly remove fluid, and some people advise not to remove more than a litre at once. I suspect that it's not so much the amount of fluid that you remove so much as the uh, severity of the tamponade situation and the duration of the tamponade situation that actually puts you at risk of this condition. Various mechanisms have been suggested, for example, increased venous return causing bowing of the septum and uh, effectively causing increased left ventricular pressures and pulmonary edema. If this happens, the management of it is basically supportive. So be aware of the potential of this condition, but I wouldn't, generally speaking in my practice, uh, reduce the rate at which I remove pericardial fluid. Um, if I had a very large pericardial effusion, I might consider draining it more slowly. There are various techniques that people use to secure the vein. You can use sutures, you can use dressings. I personally uh, don't like using sutures. I just use dressings, but uh, it it's really comes down to the person who's in charge of the procedure. Um, do warn the patient that as the fluid is cleared, the lubrication is removed and the pericardial drain can start to rub against the heart. It's not dangerous, but it can be unpleasant. So expect pleuritic pain worse on coughing or inspiration radiating to the shoulder. So warn them about it so that they know to expect it and are not disturbed by unexpected pains in their chest following a procedure that you told them had serious potential complications and prescribe some morphine so that it's their paracetamol perhaps first but certainly they can need morphine to control the discomfort after the procedure. Make sure that you very clearly document the procedure in the notes. Please always put the name of the consultant responsible for the procedure down in the notes in addition to your name and comment on how many passes that you took to achieve the pericardiosynthesis and mention any obvious complications up front clearly so that people know to watch out for further risks of, uh, for example, hemorrhage. And send the sample of the fluid for full blood count, protein, LDH, pH, glucose, microscopy and sensitivities and um, cytology. Now, we've talked previously about acute lymphoblastic leukemia and the special situation that that needs an urgent sample to be sent off. Uh, but those are standard things I'd ask for from basically every pericardial fusion. Once back on the ward, please make sure that you speak to the patient and speak to the relatives, ideally together, um, and uh, explain exactly what has happened. Go over again what, uh, what caused the pericardial effusion and what we, you, you've done. It can be very hard for people to take it in in an, in an urgent situation. Um, the ward staff should record the output from the drain and I find the most reliable way of doing that because it's often hard to see how much has come out of a bag that's fairly full is to empty it and then you can see the rate of reaccumulation and that's really important and if you can do that then there's really no need to spigot it and I would just discourage spigoting because that will increase the risk of infection. But you want to see that the reaccumulation of fluid is less than around 50 mils over the 24 hours after it's removed. If it's less than 50 mils, then you can safely remove the drain. If it's more than that, or if it's even more rapid, uh, they might need surgery. But if it's more rapid than that, you might want to keep the drain for a bit longer and think about why it's rapidly reaccumulating before it's removed. Ideally, we want to take the drain out within 24 hours because it can be uncomfortable and we also want to minimise the risks of infection. And do make sure that you get an x-ray back on the wall to see that there's no pneumothorax and to document the drain position. 
So some closing remarks. Pericardiocentesis can be a very challenging and stressful procedure and I hope that this is a useful summary of what I've learned about pericardiocentesis. Please listen to your local experts. There are more than one way to do everything in life and if you are an expert please post comment or ask questions and I, if I learn something from that and from doing this that would be valuable to me. Thank you. Rehearse a pericardioparesis procedure mentally before performing it. It's much better if you're not taken by surprise by what you see. If you're expecting a bloodstained pericardial effusion, then think that you're going to see that before you're surprised by it. Treat every pericardiocentesis, even if you expect it to be easy, treat it as practice for the really challenging scenario where you're doing a periprocedural tamponade. It's only through regular use of skills and assessment that it becomes second nature and you can be doing it instinctively rather than having to think furiously about what you're doing. That frees your mind up to deal with the challenges that each individual procedure will throw up. If you're struggling, usually there will be somebody around who you can ask for help. And it's always better for two people to be struggling than for one person to be struggling. It's not really acceptable for one person to struggle on their own. If two or three people are struggling, well, that's just unfortunately the reality of the situation. I think one of the most useful things that I have learned through doing pericardiosynthesis is to think of the echo probe as my needle. Think about uh, the precise angle you're holding the probe at as the angle you're going to hold your needle at. Think of the depth that you're going to insert it to. Think of the echo separation. Uh, though what's your safety margin in terms of how much uh, depth can you, can you, how deep can you go and think about what angle error margin there is. Choose the approach that has the best safety margin for error. If you can optimize the patient and the environment first where possible, it's much easier to do in a procedure if you have time. And so getting the patient comfortable, uh, getting the patient up on a wedge, if that's going to make it easier to do the pericardial effusion, doing an echo beforehand so that you know what to expect when the patient's actually in the room, getting everything in place makes life much, much easier. And try to take your time and make sure that you're comfortable, get the patient height right for you. Because if you're struggling because you're not comfortable, if things aren't set up the way you want them, then it will make everything harder. And once you start doing the procedure, use I strongly recommend using two hands in order to control that needle. And I would say that once your left hand is on the patient, it should stay there until the end of the procedure because that hand helps you remind you where you're going. And that hand is responsible for controlling the angle of approach and the pressure that you're, you're using. And it's also responsible for holding the needle in place once it's in the pericardium. Well, thank you very much for listening and I uh, hope that uh, you find this uh, has helped you and that you have many successes going forwards. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for listening. I uh, hope that that's been helpful and that your pericardial procedures are as controlled and calm as that in Doctor Strange. Well, hopefully maybe even calmer. Thanks a lot.